Okay. The spring in Finland looks like this. It's like the winter has come back. No way I'm going to be able to film this intro within this wind and all that sleet coming from all directions. But luckily I have some extra footage that I may be able to use thanks for the magic of video editing. So, welcome back to our course on spatial land use planning and now we are at the beginning of lecture number 5 of the course. This first part is titled Planning in Anthropocene and it discusses how the growing human population and increasing usage of natural resources have changed conservation planning and indeed the whole discipline of conservation science. This far our journey has been a rather straightforward one. We have focused on ecological factors and conservation from a biodiversity perspective. But now the path becomes harder. We have to take social aspects into account, also because, you know, people are everywhere and their perspectives matter. Because biodiversity is not evenly distributed on Earth, and the same applies for human population, we are facing a serious spatial conflict in terms of high nature value locations and regions with high land use pressures. Conservation has multiple costs, and not all of them can be measured in terms of money. There are important trade-offs among ecological, social and economic factors that we need to be aware of if we wish to make successful conservation plans. Conservation is not trivial action in the pursuit for sustainability and it has been raised to the global agenda for sustainable development. We will start today's lecture with a serious graph. It shows us the development of the global human population in numbers from year 1800 to 2100. The world population was around 1 billion in the year 1800 and it has increased over sevenfold since then. In the beginning of year 2021, there were over 7.8 billion humans on Earth. The future population size is depicted here according to three estimates. As you see, the estimated population projections vary significantly. According to the highest estimate, the world population may rise to 16 billion within the next 100 years. According to the lowest estimate, it may decline to 6 billion. Differences among the population development trajectories are not trivial either socially nor ecologically. Parallel to the population growth, also the consumption of natural resources has grown, which puts enormous pressures on habitats and ecosystems in the global scale. The concerns over population growth, human ill-being, overuse of natural resources, and environmental degradation, including climate change and biodiversity loss, led to the emergence of the sustainable development idea during the 1980s and 1990s. Sustainable development is most commonly defined according to the Brundtland report as a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Generally speaking, sustainable development builds on two ideas, development as economic and social improvement and the environmental impact of that development. This means a union of two rather contrasting streams of thinking, one that advocates socio-economic development as a desirable change and the other that constantly worries and gives warnings on the environmental cost of that desired development. To find a balance among the contrasting views, sustainable development calls for a combination of ecological, social and economic perspectives so that all of the three need to be met in order to create initiatives that are truly sustainable. Sustainable development ideology has also received critique. 
the main critique targets the anthropocentrism in its definition. Sustainable development builds on the needs of people, and although the ecological concern is emphasized, the ecological perspective is not seen as of equal importance. So, Sustainable development agenda is ambitious in its aim of solving social, economic and ecological issues at the same time. However, it is correct in the sense that the mentioned global challenges are interlinked and thus they cannot be solved individually. To react to the global issues and to bring clarity into the agenda, the United Nations have launched the Global Action Plan for Sustainable Development in 2015. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development includes 17 global goals for sustainable development, two of which are related to conservation actions. Goal 15 deals with oceanic ecosystems, and Goal 16 targets terrestrial ecosystems. In the phrasing of both goals, conservation of ecosystems has been given equal emphasis as the sustainable use of natural resources derived from the ecosystems. The way the sustainable development goals are presented follows the general discourse used with sustainable development agenda since the 1990s. It is appealing, but remains vague. It allows for multiple interpretations, which suits well the aim of international advocation for global implementation. The challenge sustainable development tries to solve is a massive one. Can human aspirations be met within environmental limits, and if so, how? The problem with the idea of sustainable development and with the sustainable development goals is that it identifies a problem, but it does not identify a solution. The general aim is good, but little is said on the actual actions that need to be undertaken in order to achieve, say, holding of biodiversity loss. One way to bring realism to the overarching aims of the sustainable development agenda is to use a targeted approach. Holding biodiversity loss is of course tied to conservation actions and how to do that belongs to the interdisciplinary field of conservation planning. But again, things are not that straightforward because we live in a changing world. The way in which people perceive nature conservation and nature itself has changed significantly in the last few decades. The change in the relationship between people and nature is reflected in the goals of conservation planning also. Conservation planning has moved from questions on reserve or protected area selection to questions that acknowledge the complex interactions between nature and people, such as the provision of ecosystem services. In the 1960s and 70s, the prevalent framing of conservation focused on species and wildlife protection, reflecting strongly a so-called wilderness ideology that places intrinsic value for the wild nature. In the 1980s, people started to acknowledge increasing species extinction and environmental degradation caused by widespread habitat loss, environmental pollution and overexploitation of natural resources. Strong calls for protecting nature without human influence were raised. Population biology became important in underpinning the conservation action, and natural resource management took long leaps in aiming to secure the food, fuel, and other resource provision for the growing human population. During this era, for example, calculations on the maximum carrying capacity and maximum sustainable yield of fish and other wildlife were abandoned. The turn of the century then saw the rising of the ecosystem services framework. The beginning of the 21st century was all about the benefits ecosystems provide for people. Systems thinking started to replace the species-centered population approach. Also, environmental economics approach to conservation agenda. 
This was in line with the sustainable development ideology that has become so widespread and as we know, according to it, sustainability should be achieved in the ecological, social and economic sense simultaneously. The most current framing of conservation is based on a view that seeks for interactions between people and nature. Environmental change is acknowledged as a global and largely irreversible phenomenon and researchers study topics such as resilience to change and adaptation to change. Instead of ecosystems, researchers increasingly speak about social ecological or socio-ecological systems. That means complex and interacting systems where nature and people are intertwined and the ecological and the social sphere cannot be separated, but they need to be analyzed together. Such an approach is a deeply interdisciplinary one. It combines ecological sciences with the social sciences and lately also humanities are increasingly incorporated. The reason why the paradigmatic idea of what is nature has changed in recent decades ultimately lies in the growth of human population and the effects population growth and increasing consumption per capita have had on nature. The influence of human population growth is everywhere, although the population density is not evenly distributed. Similarly, there are large spatial differences in the per capita consumption around the world and also within countries. Because of the widespread effects of human population on Earth, we have begun to speak of the current era as the age of Anthropocene. It is an unofficial unit of geologic time used to describe the most recent period in Earth's history when human activity started to have a significant impact on the planet's climate and ecosystems. So, the human influence extends to every corner of the globe and it has proven to be an evolutionary force that affects all Earth's spheres. That is lithosphere, meaning land, hydrosphere or water cycles, biosphere referring to all living things and atmosphere, meaning that the sphere of Earth that surrounds the whole planet. There are increasing demands for land for human settlements, infrastructure and food production, and demands for water and other resources. All these demands and the demanded natural resources are unevenly distributed on Earth and often they do not meet each other. For example, groundwater is an ample resource here in Northern Europe, but extremely rare in many dry locations around the globe. Another specific trend in the Anthropocene is increasing urbanization, which goes hand in hand with population growth. People move to cities from rural environments to make a living. Urbanization leads to a situation where people become increasingly detached from nature, spatially and often also mentally. However, material connections such as food remain, although the production chains become longer. This means that although the urban population may not need as much land for housing, they or we derive resources from surrounding areas. This leads to an upscaling of human impacts on environment as the ever growing urban population needs to be maintained by the resources derived from very urban and rural areas. So those regions where most people live exert strong land use pressures to nearby areas. Unfortunately, the regions with dense human populations often coincide with the most urgent needs to protect nature from overexploitation. These regions include Southeast Asia, Central America and Tropical Africa. Northwest Europe and Greenland show very contrasting situations. These latter regions have a sparse human population and low conservation priority from a global perspective. Thus, our situation here in Finland is not globally representative, although we do have severe conservation issues here as well. 
This map of global conservation priorities is a result of a zonation analysis done by Bozols and colleagues, and it is probably one of the most ambitious zonation prioritizations done in recent years. Using global datasets on red listed species, ecoregions, present and future land use, information on existing protected areas and administrative regions, Hosols and colleagues compared global priorities in biodiversity conservation and national conservation targets. As a result, the study demonstrated how following national policies in allocating additional conservation, we end up having a significantly lower benefits in terms of biodiversity when compared to global priorities. If we could implement conservation internationally according to global priorities, the conservation outcome would be much higher as shown in the performance curve graph here. Implementation of conservation plans is difficult and conservation action is inherently political. These are the two key questions that all conservation stakeholders will ask. How much does this conservation effort cost? What are the benefits for people and the society? Not all costs are measured in terms of money. The history of conservation, if inspected through a critical lens, is filled with stories of inequality and power misuse. Especially in so-called developing countries, people have been relocated from their homes and forced to abandon their livelihoods because of establishment of nature parks, often based on an initiative of representatives of more wealthy nations. This dark history of conservation should not be buried, but tied to its context, the wilderness ideology combined with colonialism. Currently, human rights are to be taken seriously in conservation planning and action. We need sound, ecologically recent political and economic solutions in order to facilitate the coexistence of people and nature. The so-called new conservation science is a broad interdisciplinary field of research that explicitly recognizes the tight coupling of social and natural systems or social ecological systems. Already in year 1985, Sole describes conservation biology as a synthetic and multidisciplinary field. In his seminal paper, norms and values underlying the practice of conservation biology were described and the intrinsic value of biodiversity and life were emphasized. In 2012, Kareva and Marvier presented their updated view on the new conservation science. They argued that the disciplinary scope of conservation has become even broader and that a more anthropocentric mindset has risen within the conservation community. There have been accounts for and against the updated definition of conservation science, and those who disagree have contrasted the classic view of conservation biology with the new conservation movement. At least two things have not changed despite the debate. Both views see protection of biodiversity as the utmost goal of conservation, and both agree that conservation is an evidence-based crisis discipline that always works with limited knowledge and in a hurry. According to new conservationists, a key goal of conservation science is seen as the improvement of human well-being through the management of the environment and conservation is very much seen as a managerial action. Conservation strategies that jointly maximize benefits to people and to biodiversity are sought for. These tools include systematic conservation planning and, in the political realm, formal priority setting. So, the so-called new conservation agenda relies on these core principles or functional postulates. Firstly, it is acknowledged that pristine nature, untouched by human influences, does not exist. Secondly, the fate of nature and that of people are seen as deeply intertwined. Thus, people are dependent on nature and nature is dependent on people. 
Thirdly, it is noted that nature can be surprisingly resilient. Ecosystems can resist human-induced pressures and recover from significant environmental changes. The fourth principle is that human communities can avoid the tragedy of the commons. This refers to the well-known conflict between individual and collective rationality, a situation where individuals neglect the well-being of society in the pursuit of personal gain. As a result, a shared resource becomes depleted due to the greed of its users, unless the usage of that resource is taken under strict covenants. In new conservation, more faith is put into people's ability to abandon personal greed, and it is argued that sustainable conservation can be achieved by empowering local people to make decisions for themselves. The fifth core principle is that local conservation efforts are deeply connected to global forces. In political sense, conservation actions are undertaken in line with international agendas and targets. Global forces can also relate to funding and market economy. Large international businesses can adopt conservation programs as part of their greening agendas or with the aim to compensate for their environmental footprint. What practical advice follows from the core principles? There are five key conclusions. Because human impact is everywhere, conservation must occur within human altered landscapes. A poet would lament that there are no white areas on the map of the world anymore. Then, because of the spatial overlap of human occupation and conservation needs, conservation needs people's support. If the locals oppose conservation action, the outcome is not durable nor sustainable. Resulting from the fact that conservation is expensive, conservationists must work with corporations. The business sector also has its own interests for conservation, as I already explained. The ethical grounds of such conservation actions would deserve a cause on its own. Another conclusion relating to the economics of conservation is that successful conservation seeks to jointly maximize ecological and economic objectives. Sustainable conservation businesses could, in the best scenario, hold biodiversity protection as their main focus while funding themselves, and thus they would not be dependent on money coming from the outside. Finally, conservation must not infringe on human rights, and conservation must embrace the principles of fairness and gender equity. Many of these ideas may seem obvious to people living in the global north, but they can be quite radical in the context of so-called developing countries. In many of these countries, there is significant spatial overlap of biodiversity and land use pressures from growing human population, and the implementation of conservation agendas has often overlooked social aspects, including human rights. Examples of this include land grabbing from indigenous people in order to establish protected areas that exclude human inhabitation, as I already mentioned. On the other hand, the social problems caused by urbanization and population growth and the need for social development to improve people's well-being can exert huge pressures on biodiversity. The societal development is paid through economic growth, which in turn is based on the use of nature and its resources. There are politicians who claim that not every country can afford conservation, and then there are conservationists who argue that people do not have the right to exploit nature for people's benefit. You can imagine the heated debates, value conflicts and power struggles that are ongoing on the global conservation arena. What then is the role of protected areas in this new era of conservation? To start with, it is important to see protected areas as complex social ecological systems that are not isolated from the other world. <laughs> 
Protected areas exist within an ecological, social, political and economic context and they must be treated and managed as such. Then, protected areas are under pressure. No designation should be taken for granted. The value and effectiveness of each protected area must be rigorously demonstrated to retain political support, and this reasoning has to be done time and time again. Thus, conservationists need to actively build resilience for protected areas in order to resist the land use pressures from other sectors. Although a protected area can be fenced, it never is an isolated patch nor a bounded landscape element. There always are cross-scale interactions and interdependencies such as animal movement and various kinds of disturbances, let alone the human impacts that affect all protected areas, including climate change. Those protected areas are affected by external processes. Also, protected areas have a role in the current and future human well-being, and these social-ecological interactions are complex and hard to measure and difficult to forecast. As a result, if protected areas are to provide a sustainable future for biodiversity, their social and ecological roles need to be periodically re-evaluated, renegotiated and re-envisioned to ensure that they remain relevant. This means reframing the relationship between people and protected areas. In the end, this leads to ever refining conceptualization of the relationship between people and nature. It includes evaluation on what is worth conserving in nature and what is left out of conservation action. Thank you for viewing. Remember that the lecture continues with the second part.